Hello, and welcome to an intro to Anthro with Two Humans. I'm human number one, John McCrae. And I'm human number two, John Lee. And this is the podcast where we reassess what it means to be human. And the title of today's episode is Rude, Crude, Lewd and Unglued. Bad behavior in public places. <laughs> so, we're going to be talking about bad behavior, John. Uh, specifically, people behaving badly in movies, live theaters, and on airplanes. Oh, yeah. Public places. On airplanes. <laughs> Thank you. We touched on this last week. But yes, it, we need to, we as a country need to have, we need to all sit in a circle <laughs> and pass the talking stick. Oh, no, you know what I mean? The talking stick. <laughs> it take forever for that thing to get from the, the East Coast to the West Coast. I don't care. Jeez. It's gotta go. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, like I say, it's going to be movies, live theater, but it could be any, any place like grocery stores, restaurants. Uh, kids' sporting events, uh, you name it. Oh boy, yeah, that's bad. Kids' sporting yeah. events. I, I, fortunately, my kids play stuff that they they're not into the right, soccer right. or the baseball. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, Jules is into <laughs> roller derby, which is super <laughs> intense. But everybody's yeah, yeah. into it. How about no matter what, parents that, that you know, and jump no up and cause a scene or something during the? That seems like that would be the... no, really? never. <laughs> People yell stuff, but it's never, it's not like uh, getting mad right. or anything. It's just like hooting and hollering. It's very, it's pretty rowdy. Uh, yeah. It's, pre- it's yeah. really great. It's really, and she's amazing. Like they really pound <laughs> each other. She has to wear a mouthpiece and jump over shit. And, That's so good. I mean, That's it's so crazy. Great. I never understand. And then my son's into yeah. parkour. So, you know. Neither of them are into team, team, real, you know, right, classic right. team sports. I've never God. understood the because I, I have friends who are. How, into, do you, how do you make? I'm sorry. How do you make points, or how do you win in roller derby? Have you been able to figure it out? Or? Oh well, okay. So it it started out. It was a fake yeah. sport. You know, it was like wrestling, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, back right. when we were growing up, and then somewhere along the line, the women kind of took yeah. it over. And created an actual sport, so there are there is a point yeah. system. The it's pretty complicated actually, but the 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 core of it is is that a person wears a helmet with a star okay. on, and they're the jammer, <laughs> and the jammer is the only one who can score. Yeah. Okay. Each team has a jammer. Right. Sometimes, um, there are penalty boxes and stuff. Um, but but if the jammer has to get past all of the other team, their opposing right, team right. and lap them. And every time they lap them, every person they lap after that, really? they score points. Wow. That's complicated. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's intense, man. It's what was really it? Do you remember a uh, couple movies come to mind? First of all, Raquel Welch in uh, yes. the Kansas city bomber. She played the Kansas city bomber, Kansas city bomber. Yes, absolutely. Did Which she was ever, a, uh, that was a beautiful, beautiful a roller, woman. But that was a roller derby movie. She, was, <laughs> she was. yes, yes, it was. It was a roller right. derby. And then uh, with yeah. Raquel Welch, we should do. We should do like oh a stage God. that for the stage, like a musical. <laughs> yes, that's a great. Idea. And then uh, we could get my all of right. my daughter's friends to right. be the chorus. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it'd be authentic. People would be like, "Yeah, that really was a uh, that was real roller derby that they were doing." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then a uh, rollerball. Remember rollerball with James Conn? Rollerball. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. James Conn. Jonathan. I remember that word. <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah. Oh, he just killed. I love those motorcycles oh, yeah. that were pulling yeah. people around. The cl- All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was some of that. All right. Before we I get know, too I far. Know. We do have business to do. Uh, so. But we're going All to right. look at how we got to this place, John, where it seems like it's a common occurrence that people are losing their minds when they go out in public. And I would. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it seems like it's worse than ever. I don't know. I mean, I, I put a question mark on that. Is it worse than ever? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, but, but it certainly right. seems like right. it. I And I was thinking it, it's almost, uh, it's expected. <laughs> you expect somebody to lose their mind when you go to out. To lose it. You know, 
Mm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'd say anytime I get on a plane or I go to a movie, it's it's almost like an Hercule Poirot novel that <laughs> when people are coming in, I'm looking at the suspects. <laughs> Who done it? Yes. Yes. They're not hard to right. pick out. Right. They really aren't. They... <laughs> but I'm just trying to see like all right, who, what are they going to do? What are they going to say? You know, how are uh-huh. they going to lose their mind? Um, but we're going to look at the history of public behavior. And then we're going to talk a little about the okay. social contract. And that's the unspoken mm. agreement between all of us uh, in a society or community uh, to reduce tension and make things run as smoothly as possible, hopefully. <laughs> God, you're right about that. And uh, in all transparencies, I'll admit that I've been known to lose my mind <laughs> in public before. Uh, but you don't really vocalize, do you? I feel like you just turn it into cancer <laughs> inside your well, belly. I, I, uh, <laughs> I've been known to drop some F-bombs at restaurants. And usually, and like my uh, the last time I did it was at my mechanic's. And it was a big oh, chain. No. It, it was a big chain uh, mechanic, national chain. Yeah. And I had gone out during uh-huh. the, the morning on a Sunday and my tire was flat. Okay. And oh, you know how man. it is on Sunday. Nothing's open. So you got to look around and see which ones are, yeah. you know, which mechanic is open. So I found one that's national chain and they said, go ahead and make an appointment online. Okay. So I made it online. They sent me a confirmation. It was like 10 in the morning. I was supposed to go in at two in the afternoon. When I go in, okay, okay, I have Mary (laughs) Mary drive, follow me over there. Uh, And when I get Mm -hmm. over there, the place is packed. Okay. And so I go up to the counter and I say to the guy, okay, I have a two o'clock appointment. I know where this (laughs) is going. (laughs) And I showed him the reminder and the appointment. And he goes, what did you, you booked it online? Don't book it online. You got to call us. And I was like, wait a second. You know, this is, you're getting mad at me. I did call you. Because this is your website that I, you know, that I did it on because you're, he was like, oh, that's from corporate. You know, you got to call us. And he was kind of throwing it back on me. No. And that's when I lost it. I uh, lost it. Finally, because now it was too late yeah. for me to do anything, you know. Um, oh, and so I, I remember. But didn't you have a spare? Why did you, um, what, what happened? Well, Why I, did you, you put the spare on, but you wanted right, to get the, the right. tire plug. So you, cause you had one of those, uh, <laughs> temp little spares. tiny one. Yeah. 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 Here's what I would yeah. have done. Take this, take the okay. flat tire, put it mm-hmm. in your trunk, leave the little thing on it and drive <laughs> around on it. And then like in a few days, get it taken care of. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, that was one that I usually like to take. It really bothers me when something's wrong with the car. Like I got to get it fixed immediately. Yeah, no. And I now understand. he had. Yeah, and it's unsafe. What I'm what I'm proposing is quite See, unsafe. I've never seen somebody with like four of those little things on. You know what I mean? Like you just reached a point where you've just bought four of those little donuts that you put on your car. If it could be done, I would do it. I would do it. But anyway, I kind of lost my at that point because when he was putting it on me. You know, mm. and I'm like, I followed, this is what, mm, don't put it yeah. on me. You know, that's what kind of got me a little worked right. up. Yep. And so oh. I remember at some point, sorry, and I usually happened. blank out when I get really mad. <laughs> so, but I remember saying like, ah, fuck it. And just walking out of the door. <laughs> and uh, and next thing I know, I'm out in the parking lot with him. And he's, he's chased me down. <laughs> he's chased me down. And I don't know what else I said, but he was saying, sir, sir, sir. There's no reason to be like that. I'm a Christian. <laughs> so I, you know, I, must have, I must have got a little blue in there on top of my, just my fuck it. You know. Maybe, or maybe he realized, oh yeah. shit, I was stressed. I turned it on him. That's, right. I'm going right. to, I'm going to. So wait, wait, he know. did, he, he had somebody come out and change, fix it and change it out in the parking lot for me. Oh and then what God. I did, I went out and got them uh, sandwiches. For lunch, I bought them a bunch of sandwiches oh. and cupcakes to take back over there afterward. Oh, <laughs> I you made amends, I made as they say. Yeah, it's fantastic. I yeah. love that. So I can explode, but I also know when I explode, and then I try to try to make it better afterwards. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, 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 same thing. 
I, I, everybody has a tipping right. point. Everybody has a, my son still points out this time I rode this guy's ass because he honked at me at a stoplight or something. He'd be like, remember that time? It was like 10 years ago or something. What happened? Were you just, just <laughs> like lost it? I don't even remember it really, yeah. but he does. I, I think, I think what happened was, uh, a guy was riding on riding yeah. me, and so then when he passed oh, me, I yeah, rode him yeah. or some you know stupid road rage. Yeah, thing. those get out of control. But quickly, anyway, I think yes, they do. Yeah, especially out here in L.A., you get end up with a I bullet in your head. I did love like that one time. Mary was asleep in the car, and some guy was riding my ass uh, out in Arizona, and it was the mm -hmm. same thing. Like. Mm -hmm. When he finally got around me, just being mm -hmm. a jerk, I was like right on his ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he finally yeah. gave me the two pieces, the, the peace side, you know, like and Mary's like wakes up later, like, like hey. everything okay. And we're going like, a, you know, 100, 100 hey. miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right on his ass. Honey, what's wrong? I just want to get there. <laughs> Uh, John, before we begin, though, we, we do have some podcast business to take care of. Uh, I just want to let everyone know sure do. Uh, next week's episode and probably the week after next is going mm. to be off schedule mm. a, little, a couple days late. No, oh, because boy. what? Yeah, because okay. I'm <laughs> this is uh, no, this is not. I, this is I cannot handle. Yeah, I'm going to lose it. Fuck it. I'm going to. <laughs> ah, fuck it. Then fuck the podcast. Then uh, I'm going back to Kansas City for our 40th high school reunion. I cannot wait for the report. I wish I were coming, but I, I have a gig in San Diego. Uh, but I would love to be there with you. Uh, I would love to watch you. You know, go right. through that, right? Uh, <laughs> to walk the gauntlet, as they <laughs> well, say. Uh, first of all, it. Yeah, you're going to be into. You were coming originally. You were going to come. I was originally slotted yeah. to go, but as is my life lately, I I travel quite a bit. And can you say what you're working, what you're doing this weekend? I am going to be um, emceeing and performing comedy at a fundraiser for the Association for Recovery and <laughs> Higher Education. Very nice. I am uh, I'm on their board of directors <laughs> and apparently part of my <laughs> part of my job yeah. description is to uh MC oh, and perform great. but uh, yeah it'll be great it's a great organization uh Look at that. yeah so it's the show that you directed and co-wrote with me and uh it's it's called Addiction 101 and it's a comedy show but it, it does has fit. heart I, it I has think heart. it's kind of a lot Doesn't about it? uh no. the history of addiction the history of addiction as well. Yes, it it really is. It's a lot about the history of the <laughs> show. Really, it's like an episode of this show. It's... We're basically a one trick yeah. pony. Yeah. You and I. <laughs> we just changed the the subject. We put a different attachment on the vacuum, <laughs> but it's still the the same vacuum. It's, it's still, still the sucks. vacuum. Still well sucks. said. Yep, still <laughs> sucks. So, uh, but also. Um, my wife, a couple months ago, I think it was, she suggested we do a show, a topic of nostalgia. And so in the, it's nostalgia from a psychological, cultural standpoint. And so this mm -hmm. was like a perfect, yes. this is almost like doing a participant observation, going out in the field to look at nostalgia. I love it. So I um, love it. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to say, I have events, family events and reunion events booked up for the next week. Yeah. So. You, yeah. You don't have a lot. I mean, you have not gone. You don't go to Kansas right. City a lot. So when you do, they shut the town <laughs> down for you. I mean, they it's like a holiday in Kansas City. And you're busy. You're booked I am solid. Booked solid appearances and dinners and family and oh Two, my God. And, I can't wait. Yeah, to two events a day at least for an entire week. Jesus. Entire week. <laughs> oh my God! You're going to want to kill yourself by the time you get back. So that's the reason why that our <laughs> next week's episode and week after is going to be a couple because I'm going to be trying to put them to get research them, put them together in between, mm -hmm. like a couple hours, and then we have to find a way to right. record them. We got to record them. You got to bring your microphone. I'll have to see, I'm I'm really <laughs> there's I'm really yeah. my suitcase is is packed. Is packed right now. You, where does it carry on? Just sling it over your shoulder, <laughs> like Buckminster Fuller. Oh, just like have it. 
<laughs> already yeah, exactly. on. There you go. Yeah. I'll just pl- I'll plug in yep. right when I get on the plane. I'll be like, <laughs> hello. And, hello perfect. and welcome. I can tap in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll tap in for mission control. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. So back to today's topic, bad behavior in, in public. Mm. Uh, it seems like anytime yeah. you read the news now, there's another instant of people mm-hmm. being assholes in public. <laughs> so. Yes. Yes. It's a big, it's a big problem. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a pandemic. Right. And I'm not sure. And I'm not even talking about the, like the ones that really turn violent, like, like shootings or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Of course. And maybe we will have to do an episode on wh- how we've reached the point where, we're going out and killing a bunch of people that you don't know is like a common response to like normal, just normal life stresses or life uh, difficulties. And I'll say that as someone who has had depression throughout my life, who struggled with addiction and financial difficulties and gone through divorce and lost jobs, who's, gone through multiple dramatic breakups with multiple women uh, who's felt Mm, I had to walk through some (laughs) of those who's who's felt imposter (laughs) syndrome and social inferiority uh, just about everything else you could possibly feel I I just want to tell people you're not alone and you you get through it (laughs) you get through it yes 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 whatever happened to just drinking heavily I know, you know, just going out and tying yeah. one on and just slowly throwing your own life away. Why? Why involve other people in it? Yes. Other people. Yes. That's what you and I did. We just drank know, ourselves like, to death. What happened to that? The good old fashioned yeah. way of handling yeah. you, you shut yourself in your own house. Nobody ever sees you, you know, just once or twice a year. Yeah. And uh, you hang out in your <laughs> underwear, watch unemployment television. Yeah. Just don't <laughs> hurt anybody else. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. John, we're talking about just like people doing rude and inconsiderate things on flights, for example, or in the theater. Yes. And yes. You know, you travel a lot. You perform a lot. Boy, yeah. do I. I'm. I mean, uh, yeah, I do travel a lot. And have and, have uh, you noticed? I've been lucky. No, I've been really, really, and I travel a yeah. lot. Yeah. I mean, I probably travel twice a month. Right, easy, right. right? And on long flights, overseas. And uh, long overseas yeah. connections. Hell, I'm going to Bulgaria <laughs> in the fall. No. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. And Bratislava. Really? I'm huge in Bratislava. Huge, enormous. The whole... The whole city turns out <laughs> for me in Bratislava. What for? For an improv? improv but yeah, show? I have never really. Y- yes, it's an improv. They love improv in Bratislava. No, it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a central p- a point yeah. that a lot of people a lot of people from a lot of places can travel to. I don't know. I'm Bulgaria? just going. That's all I in Bulgaria. I'm going to Sofia, Sofia, yeah. Bulgaria. Then I'm going to um, the UK, Birmingham. Oh, and uh, yeah, and then to um, uh, I don't know some other place. Yeah. Uh, I can't same thing right like now. like anyway, teaching improv, but, teaching improv, and performing improv. Well, we perform. Yeah, yeah we perform, and then uh, sometimes we teach, sometimes we don't. Okay. It depends on the okay. on the gig. Um, but yeah, usually a theater books us, and then we perform, and then the next day sometimes we do like a master class. Fantastic! Uh, All right for it. Because we're masters, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's not a beginner's <laughs> course. We're it's a master's course. It's black belt. Fantastic. I'm sorry I keep interrupting you, but I think I'm fascinated by Bulgaria. No, but, uh, but have you noticed, <laughs> like in theaters, when you go, how are the crowds? Have you noticed a difference in crowds, or you? No, I mean Europeans behave themselves wonderfully. I mean, there's never they're fantastic. Um, And even in the States, I mean, I'm in theaters, so I I think it would be different if I was in like a stand-up comedy club, you know, where people just yell stuff. That's horrid. I mean, that's just horrid. 
Um, but, but in theaters, no, I haven't had a lot of troubles to be honest and not a lot of troubles on the planes (laughs) either. I'm just kind of blessed, I think, or maybe more likely I just don't notice, you know, I'm just, cause I can't sleep on planes. So I work the whole time. So I'm one of those guys on my computer the whole time. So I, I, if things did happen, I wouldn't even know. I put the headphones on and I don't, you could do anything on the plane. And as long as I have my headphones on, I don't care. The biggest problem I've had is, look, if you're the, let me ask you, okay. this is okay. a pop quiz. If you're in the middle right. seat, right. okay, do you get the armrest on the right, <laughs> the armrest on the left, both armrests or no armrest? I, I've you're in the gone with no armrest is usually how I do What? You're yeah. too nice. But I'm saying, what do you deserve? What should you give the middle seat? If you're on the aisle- yeah. Do you give him your right armrest so that he can have that armrest? I, I, I would say you have to switch off. You have to switch off armrest. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's absolutely wrong. Middle seat gets both armrests. That's just what they get. They get that because it's a yeah. horrible place okay, to be. Okay, I see your point. And you, and don't, that doesn't mean like share an armrest. I don't want to yeah. feel your arm yeah. hair rub up against my arm hair. I yeah. hate that. I'll go off on you, man. I'll open the emergency exit. I, that you know, shit. I'm I'm not that big of a person, but I can't imagine. Like when you get a couple of like really large people in, oh, like big guys, God. big guy, yeah. like big six foot five or yeah. something, all mm-hmm. squeezed in there, mm-hmm. and I'm in the middle yeah. seat. That one gets a little uncomfortable oh. for me. Oh. <laughs> It's if you're a big person, it's just it's just yeah. a it's torture yeah. is what it is. It's just torture. Uh, but I'm going to give you some notable examples of bad behavior in the last couple of years. And a lot of this happened in 2023 for some reason. A lot of these examples I was finding. <clears throat> and okay, in the article, people forgot how to act in public, uh, which came out in August 2023. Alex Abad Santos uh, notes that in June 2023, Albanian pop star Bibi Resha, R-E-X-H-A, was hit in the face with a cell Ooh. phone that somebody had thrown at her Jesus. while she was per- per- performing on stage in New York. And, and it hit what? her in the face and she had to have stitches over her eyes. Is she, is she's a she's singer? She's a singer. And you know how people throw stuff up on okay, stage? yeah. Uh, somebody yes. threw their cell phone up there at her, and the yeah, that's been happening right, more and more. Right, and then a few mm-hmm. days later, a fan rushed on stage uh, in Los Angeles and slapped and scratched uh, the singer Ava Max while she was performing. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I'm yeah. That's do you know Ava right. Max? Do you follow Ava? Not right. No, I was just trying. <laughs> no, but but he came up, and that usually you you know you'd always have like like in the Frankie goes to Hollywood video, you know people come up and try to like kiss him or yeah. something. This guy came up and they actually slapped right. her in the face. So and yeah, Jesus so, Christ. Uh, and then in June 2023 as well, uh, the singer Pink, when she was in London, uh, someone threw a bag up on stage. You know, people are throwing gifts up on stage. They threw a bag of their mom's ashes. Yeah. Up on stage. Oh, she- <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. That's kind of, that's, well, it's not too bad. I mean, it didn't hurt. I, well, anybody, I know it? it's kind of weird, though, is it? I know that. <laughs> well, yeah, it's yeah. weird. No, no yeah. question. It's weird, but uh, it's weird to throw anything right. up on stage flowers, gifts, anything. What are you doing? What? What's yeah, that I guess all Mary about? told me that share, uh, people used to throw uh, sailor hats up there from the turn back time. Uh, yeah, oh, like they, it was like a well, homage nice. to turn back time, and then Cher slipped oh. on one and like injured herself. <laughs> so uh oh, God, yeah. Cher! What was she doing? She was wearing some crazy yeah, costume, and the high heels, probably. But but I mean, again, it's like there mm-hmm. were so many hats being thrown, and people used to throw underwear up there. Remember with Tom Jones, they throw underwear. Yes, up yeah. Well, for my performances, <laughs> I still get that people throw underwear. <laughs> Bunch of dudes. Bunch of dudes. In I Bulgaria. haven't bought underwear in. <laughs> I haven't bought any underwear for six years. Yeah. Preferably keep them in the uh, keep them in the package. <laughs> and if you can, that's fine. Yeah. Either way, it yeah. can wash. It's just and fabric. if you can 
<laughs> I'll wash it, put some bleach in there, and get it right back into working. And if you order. could include the uh, return receipt, just in case, so we can. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, in case it's the wrong size. Uh, in July 2023, a fan in Las Vegas threw a drink on Cardi B when she was when she was performing on stage. Oh yeah, I read and about she, that. She threw her yeah. microphone back at them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's one yeah. way of handling and, uh, it. And then one more time in uh, in July 2023, Harry Styles in Vienna. So this is like a international problem. Ooh, that's where I'm really? going. I'm going to Vienna. That was the one I couldn't remember. He was yeah. hit in the eye with a skittle. Somebody was throwing skittles up on stage. Oh, yeah. man. Those are projectiles. Those Skittles are hard. That's not like an M M&M and M where it has a little give to it. It's like a it's like a BB or Those something. Are, they said he it he really is. His eye open. Those are like yeah. It's he like couldn't a, open his eye. Oh, Harry, yeah. handsome, very handsome. Uh, and then a couple more examples in September twenty three. Uh, tw- uh, an article titled "Audiences Behaving Badly: An Epidemic of Antisocial Behavior in Theaters, Concerts, and Gigs." Bethany Minnell notes that in England in 2023, riot police were called out to a performance of the bodyguard in Manchester, England, mm. uh, to remove people who mm. were singing over the, the lead singer and the cast. <laughs> so. Wow. So it was the musical, right. the bodyguard. Right. And people were singing too loud over the lead <laughs> right. singer. You couldn't hear and they and they brought the riot right. police. But people couldn't people Jesus. couldn't hear the actual performance because the audience was singing so loud. So they came in to try to remove them, and then I they mean, were rioted against them. Jesus, yeah, I'm with the rioters <laughs> on that one. Let me sing if I'm in there. First of all, look, you're at yeah. the bodyguard. Okay, you're not seeing Shakespeare. You paid money to go see the right. bodyguard, right? Uh, you know, and I, listen, I love Whitney Houston, but any musical based on right. film, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's like Bad News Bears. I, I think it. Uh, I'd love to see that musical if they ever came up with a Bad News Bears. That'd Maybe be a good too. One. That movie holds yeah. up, by the way. The first one, up. not the one with Billy Bob Thornton, but the first one with Walter Matthau. Yeah, no, no, no. The very, of course, yeah. And even the first one of that, there were more after, like yeah, when they went to yeah, Japan and yeah. stuff. No. Uh, it, it, the shark jumps yeah. really It's got to be Buttermaker. But Buttermaker that first in the one. first car, the pool cleaner. Yep, yeah. Buttermaker. Uh, yes. And then uh, she also notes that in August 2023, uh, the police again were called out to remove rude and abusive audience members from a performance of Grease in London's West End. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's the musicals. I think musicals are driving people crazy. <laughs> I think we need to outlaw yeah, that's musicals. One, that's one way. And I'm all for it. I'll I'll be first in line. I'm done with the I, musicals. I read in one uh one article they were talking about like the response for the the theater community in England is they've stopped saying in their promotional materials, you'll be dancing in the aisles. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> no. But you know what? Both Grease and the other one, they're both and yeah. the Bodyguard, they're both movies right. turned into musicals. So see, there you go. That's yeah. it. <laughs> it just drives humans crazy when you take a movie and turn it into yeah. a musical. Uh, well, that's one theory, <laughs> and I think you could put that one out there. Um, mm-hmm. But but the thing is, what, right. what I'm, I'm asking is like, what the hell's going on though? What the hell's going on when I don't? When know. you have, I have, don't know. Have we always? been this way have we always been assholes like that where we go out in in public or you know i've always thought that there were singular assholes out there but now it seems like we're living in a a golden age of assholeism (laughs) if we could say that yeah well also we're able to communicate assholishness so easily right you know, is it, it's the chicken or the egg, but you know, and then once it gets communicated, then that you got the, you know, people just kind of accept it. That's my theory. Yeah. That, you know, it, there's copycats <laughs> out there. Uh, Somebody was a jerk and that opened the doors for right, everybody to be right. a jerk. I, it's, uh, you know, I love live performance and you and I have done a lot of live, live performances. Yes, we have. Uh, and yes. I would say I even love live shows more than I do movies or even videos. And um, 
Yeah. Because it, it's like the live show feeds off the energy and the mood of the audience. Yes. And when you yes. go out at the beginning of a show, you know, you could feel it immediately what that audience is going to be like. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you can see a lot of them. Yeah. You know, unless it's a big theater, you see the first five, six, right, seven right. rows of people. And I, a lot of people don't realize yeah. that, that those actors on say that it's yeah. real. It's not on a screen. There's a people standing there. They're looking at you and you're looking yeah. at them. And, and it doesn't matter how <laughs> famous they are or how many shows they've done. They still see you. And that's still a human being that could see you looking at your phone in the front row. Yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep. Yep. Sure is. But, but I've also, I've always, uh, it's just always fascinated me that a group of people, whether it be a hundred people or a thousand people, whatever, can collectively have a mood and a personality that you can feel. You can read it immediately yes. when you come out. Yes. Yes, and you can. And in the article, people forgot how to act in public. Alex Abad Santos says that humans are incredibly social creatures and live events are moments of highly pleasurable social connections. And this yes. is what Shira Gabriel, who's a psychology professor at the University of Buffalo, calls collective effervescence. Yeah, Ooh, I like and that. It, That's a good name for <laughs> that, a band. That really is. That really is. <laughs> just boring, though. Just boring. They just plod on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Gabriel <laughs> says that collective effervescence is, quote, the way we feel connected when we're in a crowd of other people, even if we don't know them. When we're all focused mm. on a concert or play or a movie, we feel a sense of social connection and it makes us feel really good, mm -hmm. which I would mm -hmm. agree as well. And in the article about Cardi B, uh, Ayana Archie quotes John Drury, who's a professor of social psychology at the University of Sussex in England. And Drury says that, quote, people are now more individual focused. They attend events for their own individual pleasure, and they're not really thinking about being part of a group or a collective in the way that they might have been before. I I agree with that. And I think it, it's fear. I think a lot of fear <clears throat> has been injected into our yeah. culture. I'm not saying anything that isn't right, right. obvious. And I think once th that we're, all, you know, there, people are fearful of a strangers in yeah, general, yeah. I think. And uh, I think it's even harder to overcome that fear, uh, fear yeah, now, yeah. you know? I wonder, uh, how do you just... deal with it when, you, when you're when you on stage? And you say it doesn't happen a lot, but we've, we've spoken before about when you see somebody sleeping, <laughs> sleeping in the audience. Oh, yeah. No, I just meant yeah. being an asshole. Yes. Oh, God. It's just yeah. the worst. It's just like, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> My father-in-law yeah. falls has come to see me perform countless times and I, and he supports me and I really appreciate it. And he always sits in the first two rows and he always, always, always is asleep. Like right. early on, like five <laughs> minutes in, he's just out mouth yeah. open. And that I can almost, <laughs> I mean, that when you, people see you, first of all, when you're sleeping in the audience, especially yeah. a small group. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even bad behavior, I don't. I don't know. Like you see people talking or or like trying to. It used to be like trying to open up a wrapper, for example. You. you, you yes. Whatever. Yes. Yeah. Those are the words. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just like just open it. Just open it already. Or yeah, when they do it just yeah. a little bit at a time, they think they're getting. <laughs> But stuff like that, I mean, also, I'm in a different sort of right. realm because I can sort of comment on that yeah. stuff, you yeah. know, I, uh, like if a phone goes off, I, you know, just bring it in. But yeah, people on their phones in the theater. I mean, that's just not yeah. cool. You should not be yeah. doing that. Um, and, and Drury, he says that, you know, people are perhaps treating the event as an opportunity for them to build their social media profile. And... Interesting. And I've noticed that, like, I mean, it's nothing new as well, but when you go see a concert now, everybody's got their phone up watching the concert through, <laughs> through the phone. Through the through phone. Through the phone. Yeah. You know. Yes. 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 Uh, 
And, yes. and again, it's uh, Abad Santos says that live events are times when we experience important social connections, a phenomenon that happens so naturally that we don't think about what these these events mean to us until someone really screws up. And he says, yeah. when someone makes a scene yeah. in public at a group event, we're disturbed in large part because these gatherings are extremely important to our intellectual and emotional selves. Well, and I think it, we realize, oh my God, everybody's crazy. You realize every, it's like when we're driving, yeah. <laughs> when we're driving on the highway, yeah. right? You're driving on the highway and the only thing keeping you from killing people is, are those two right. yellow lines in the middle right. of the highway, yeah. right? But we've all agreed we're not going to cross the two yellow yeah. lines. And you drive thinking everybody thinks like you, and then you cl- you get off and go to a gas station and you see the other drivers. You're like, oh my yeah, God, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, so you realize the possibility that at any time somebody could go nuts <laughs> on you in a public place. I think it scares the fuck out of us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's nothing, re- there's no railing in between us and the other car when you're going down a two lane highway. No. It's a social right. contract. And the same with a stop sign. And, uh, a stop sign. People blow through stop signs stop here sign? in Albuquerque all the time. And it's such a shock. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> because first of all, you could die, you know. And and secondly, yes. uh, it's just like, that's not the agreement we all have. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And then you realize, oh, my God, this is all right. chaos. It's all a, a ruse a yeah. facade that that things are operating a- appropriately. <laughs> you know, one person shows you, right. no, it's not. Look, you can do it. Everybody does that. Yeah, my wife, my wife, when we go to a banquet, like at a wedding or something, and you know how it gets stacked up and people are, you know, getting their yeah. food and you get the plate and the silverware and then you get the meat and you're working your yeah. way down. What she'll do is go right behind it on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just go right down. And I'm, I have a real yeah. issue with that. And she's like, what? Nobody's there. It doesn't hurt anybody. I'm just yeah. smart. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're a rule right. breaker. And, and I don't like it. I don't like it. She, you know what also she'll do? If she really, if the, if she goes into a Starbucks and the line is too long, she'll pay somebody in the line, she'll say, I'll buy your coffee if you oh, buy mine, if you, oh. if, if you if you can order mine. Yeah. And the people behind her just want to right. kill her. Because you're still slowing down everybody that way. But you have the, Every, you have yeah. the money to, you just, to pay for you're it. You're cheating. Yeah, you pay for it. Yeah, it's disgusting. I have a real yeah. issue with it. The uh, And we'll talk about it a little bit more coming up. But it's like the whole idea about the lines was something that came out in the 1800s, early 1900s, when we were switching from the markets where people would just line up in front of the counter and buy something from the person, the mar- merchant. And so the whole purpose of the line was right. supposed to be a way that was equitable for people to whoever came first would get served first. And then you go down the line. Interesting. But what you, you, they found out is like, no, it's, it's not. For example, Rich people would just have their servants go wait in line in England, for example. Yes. Or people yeah. who now you see it where people who can afford it can pay to bypass a line. Like you go to Disneyland or something. You yes. Know I mean? So even the line is yes. not so equitable. Oh, my anymore. God. We went to a fancy schmancy birthday party for one of my daughter's friends when she was in uh, elementary school. And her dad was super yeah. successful. And we cut that we were the yeah, line cutters. Yeah. Oh, I, I felt I, it horrified me. I kept saying to my daughter, this is not how it is. This is not how it is. <laughs> I've only had that. What uh, Mary has a friend who's a singer and dancer in Las Vegas. And she wasn't top like, but she was hosting like a sexy cowboy show in Las Vegas. She was like the lead MC of it. And the only time I've ever been shown in front of a line was when we and she put our names at the front. And so, at the, at the, at the, oh. and I would say that that sexy cowboy show was about the closest I've ever come to <laughs> feeling like a VIP. A VIP. It was a little. It was a little sketchy because they called you just they. 
They just said McRae, <laughs> and you just walked in front of everybody, and they all looked at you like, yeah, we God gave our damn. name, and then they the walking down the uh, walking Aww. down to the front, like a like the one seat, you know, the one booth that looks out on the audience. Uh, but how do we know how to behave at live performances, and do we always behave the same at live performances? And on their website, the Seattle Shakespeare Company says that in Shakespeare's time. Audience, quote, audiences were much more rowdy and directly involved in the show than we are today. And mm. they note that in Shakespeare's day, there was no electricity. So the shows were performed in daylight and the audience could see each other. <laughs> you know, you think about the globe, mm-hmm. you could see across to the other members right. of the audience. And, and right. then because it was in the middle of the day, like the actors could see up into the audience. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, And so they say that when uh, people would interact with each other and yell things at the actors, and and I love their quote was, quote, Shakespeare's soliloquies would be said directly to the audience who could could potentially answer back. (laughs) So so when you said that, they could uh, they could yell back at the actors could be yelled back at. But people would like boo the villain or cheer for the special effects. Uh, they also said that in Shakespeare's time, the audience might dance at the end of the comedy, get up on stage and dance with the actors. <laughs> or, or they would be like walking around buying, yeah, Gotta like buying that. food and, and ale and stuff during the show. And in the article, Bowery right. Boys and Matinee Ladies, the regendering of 19th century American theater audiences, Richard Butch says, In the 1820s in America, theater was a male club, meaning that it was mostly men that went to the theater at that time. And the men were were boisterous and demanding. They drank, smoked, and they even met prostitutes at the theater. So, and, and, (laughs) and Butch says that in the 1830s, theater managers often gave prostitutes free entry to the galleries and prostitution was important to the profitability of the theaters. <laughs> so, uh, and Butch also notes that in 1802, Washington Irving, uh, the writer, described the noise coming from the top balcony in the theater as, quote, similar to that which prevailed in Noah's Ark. So people were all <laughs> talking throughout the show. Just yeah. ye- you know, you as you were t- talking about this, it reminded me of my son because, you know, he's way into hardcore mm-hmm. music and they, you know, it's understood the rules of that performance are to hurl yourself right. off the <laughs> stage and into the mosh pit. And but there are certain rules yeah. within it. Yeah. You have to do things a certain way or people will get really yeah. upset. Yeah. <laughs> And they'll like, you know, so, so th- I wish I knew what they were, but there are certain things you can and yeah, can't I, do when you're jumping into yeah, a Yeah, I was going pit. to say there are, did you ever mosh, did you do mosh pits or do you? I know. I was always too yeah. scared. I mean, I went to a lot of punk shows, but I never, yeah. yeah, no, they were too much. I was here in LA in the thick of it, you know, during some of that. And I was like, no way am I going <laughs> over there. Forget it. Um, that's crazy. Alexis talk. de Tocqueville, who, when he was at Traveling America in the 1830s, he went to a show in Philadelphia where he said, quote, the audience paid not the slightest attention to the stage, but walked about, drank together, and argued as if nothing else were going on. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I've had gigs like that. That's like a bar gig, but I mean, you're, you're at the. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I had some bar gigs that were like that. Uh, Butch also notes that members of the audience took delight in throwing apples, nuts, and numerous things on the people in the pit. And and I guess the pit <laughs> nuts, yeah, just like peanuts and like that walnuts, hurts. And what kind walnuts of nuts? and peanuts. Jesus, yeah. Yeah, you can a and peanut. The, the pit apparently, like in front of we think of the orchestra pit, but the pit used to be where people would crowd into the pit. That was where the audience was sitting in the pit. And, mm. and Butch says that sometimes the audience would, to complete the circle, like if you're talking to people in the pit during the performance, people would hop up on the stage, the front of the stage, sit there with their backs to the performers and just keep talking oh to their friends. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. 
Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. And uh, traditionally, Butch says, theater managers had accepted the extra legal prerogatives called audience sovereignty. And that was the rights of the audience to regulate itself and the performance and to utilize all manner of enforcement of their will, including rioting. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Wow. Well, that's sort of like what happens at these uh, mosh pits that my son goes to. There, there, there are people who are like, no, you don't right, do that. Right. You do this, but you don't do that. And they're badasses. And so you learn real yeah, quick. They, uh, yeah, they, it's the same thing. The audience is the one that would police itself. Like you were the one that would make certain that people mm. were behaving in the certain. Or what I love is that the audience also, if they didn't like the show <laughs> or how the show was going, or if yeah. they did, like <clears throat> if yeah. there was a, a song that they liked, then the audience would like force the singer to, you, you know, perform it again or the cast to do it again. No, oh, <laughs> do it yeah. again, you son of a bitch and get it right, right. this and time. And another thing they used to do is oh they would. Oh God. See, that's, that's it. <laughs> Everything I'm learning from this show is as bad as we think things are now. They're yeah. so much yeah. better. Things are getting better. Right. right. Uh, somebody said that, you know, one of the, the ideas, sometimes an audience, if they turned on the cast, they would make them do encores over and over again. Not because they liked it, but to like wear <laughs> them out, like to punish them. And the theater manager would have to come out and Jeez. plead with the audience not to uh <laughs> yeah don't make them do anymore oh my god just yeah. leave and then uh this all came from butch says the idea of audience audience sovereignty was founded upon a conception of performers as servants to the audience mm. and and so mm. the idea is, yes <laughs> you know I, we've changed that yeah. i think because now it's like you know you uh, yes we're thankful to go see a famous actor but there was a time where it was like the yes it was like wait a second you're serving us yeah. we should be able to do whatever we want yeah. down here keep yeah your show your fan you're doing a fantastic job now refill yeah. my yeah. drink for me <laughs> would you uh and the bowery boys uh they were like street toughs they were like fighters and just kind of thugs from the neighborhood around you know in new york city and manhattan and to give you an idea of how bad and violent things could become at, at theaters, in May 1849, there was a feud going on between two Shakespearean actors. And, and one was the Englishman <laughs> oh William Charles McCready, and the other one was an American mm. named Edwin Forrest. And <laughs> oh, Forrest, yeah, he was amazing. And McCready played his Shakespeare his very couplets. intellectual. Okay, so he would say very subtly. Mm. And Forrest was known mm. for his Shakespeare being very masculine and macho. Okay, so the American was very oh. macho. Yeah. And in an article titled, When an Argument Over Macbeth Incited a Bloody Riot, Peter Feuerherd says that people at the time began to see this argument between McCready and Forrest on how to play Shakespeare is an argument over Englishness and Americanness. Well, that's what I was <laughs> going to say. Shocking that the Englishman would be intellectual right. and the American right. would be physical. And uh, and again, Forrest kind of being this mu rugged, macho American actor became very popular with American audiences. And Betsy Goldham Kellum in the Smithsonian Magazine says, Forrest embodied self-satisfied proof that America had finally achieved cultural independence from its British forebears. And so in mm. May 1849, McCready came over on tour and was performing at the Astor Place Opera House in New York City. And what happened is a mm -hmm. lot of fans of Edwin uh, Forrest, mainly the Bowery Boys, <laughs> okay, they mm. bought tickets to see McCready. And as soon as he came out, they just started oh yelling insults at him and throwing uh, like nuts and garbage and, and pennies at him up on stage. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. Pennies. Damn. And that's back when a penny was worth <laughs> yeah. something. Uh, I, You know, that's what they do with uh, political speeches yeah. now. People just come in and scream over. Maybe that's what they've always yeah, done. Yeah. Or throw, throw eggs or something. I don't know. People are throwing all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, McCready, he, he tried to cut 
his tour short in New York and Lee, but other people that were all of his backers, you know, were like, no, you have to stay. Everything will be fine tomorrow night. Don't worry about it. And in the meantime, the Bowery boys started passing out flyers that said, working men shall Americans or English rule in the city. So, yeah. Oh my God. So, so, <laughs> I love that this is all over Macbeth, you know, this is I crazy. <laughs> These Bowery boys, did they even know what Shakespeare well, was? At they that time, have. you know, Shakespeare was, or a theater was where men would go to hang out. And you'd be boisterous mm-hmm. and you'd have mm-hmm. drinks and you'd yell at the actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it wasn't, mm-hmm. hadn't, theater hadn't reached that point where we had an etiquette yet to it. Yeah. And, and so before the next performance, 10,000 people showed up outside the Astor Place Opera House. To, oh my to God. protest against McCready. Basically, it turned into like this oh my racial God. thing against the English. You know what I mean? Oh, my and God. the crowd started throwing rocks at the theater. And, and the police and the New York militia were called out. And it got so violent that <laughs> and the, the crowd was so unruly that the militia actually fired on the crowd and killed 22 people. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I've never experienced anything like that. <laughs> like a crowd outside, like just <laughs> chanting, like throwing rocks at the theater, trying to stop you from performing. Uh, unreal. <laughs> I, just, I tried to think of McCready on stage at that point because you could hear it outside, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tried to do Macbeth, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my uh, God. And then after. Oh, oh, damn spot. (laughs) After the 1830s and 40s, Butch says, middle and upper class people wish to distinguish themselves from the uncultivated working class. And and that's Mm. when from 1830 to 1850, uh, the middle class behavior became accepted at theaters and uh, theater Mm. managers began to demand uh, proper decorum, Butch says consistent with the new manners to exclude the lower classes. So after Mm. the 1840s and like with this riot in New York, uh, that's when you began to see people move more towards the bourgeois kind of middle-class respectability at the theater. And then also where you Mm. started having theaters with, uh, they'd actually cater, different theaters would cater to different classes. So you'd have like your elite upper end opera houses down to just like your sort of vaudeville or, you know. That's like Godfather 2. Yeah. When you go to the, yeah. uh, to see, oh my girl, isn't she gorgeous? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and then after the Civil War, they say, uh, Butch notes, managers increasingly prohibited stamping feet, calls for encore and other rowdiness. And Listen, no, let them say encore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. my God. There's nothing like a standing O Cut or an encore, out. I think. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, and then in the 1890s, when women finally started coming to the theater in greater numbers, that's really when you saw people kind of calm down. Like it got, it became less violent mm-hmm. <laughs> at the theater. Uh-huh. You got the ladies. And and Butch says at that time, quote, accompanied by women, the men would then have to sit quietly and watch the show. (laughs) So so no more, (laughs) no more fighting. Uh, And then another thing you hear about today is the bad behavior in movie theaters. And with people talking or using their cell phones uh, or getting in fights, you know, when people try to shush them. Yeah. Uh, Yes. And, and Butch says he has another article called American Movie Audiences in the 1930s. And he says that when Nickelodeon movie theaters first came up in the early 1900s, uh, working class neighborhoods filled them with voluble audiences who again set the tone and pace to fit their own purposes. So at that point, he says immigrants turned these commercial spaces, meaning the movie theaters, into social clubs for their own needs. You know ah, what I mean? So they'd pay they they'd sensibly pay for the movie, but basically they would just get in there and use it as like a party right, house. Right. Just some place to get out of your tenement, you know what I mean? Where you're crowded in there. Yeah, just some place to yeah. go. Uh 
Yeah. New York's still like that. People go to movies just to get, <laughs> you know, out of the yeah. heat. Uh, who cares what's and, playing? And you know, at that time, you had the piano players who would play along with the movie. And right, which says right. it was the same thing that at that point, audiences controlled the meaning of the movie by directing the musicians playing the music to go along with it. <laughs> so if people didn't like what the piano player was playing, they would probably threaten him with some harm or something, you know, yell at him to <laughs> uh, step it up, pick yeah. it up. Pick it up, Archie. Yeah. And they're all just like smoking and drinking and, you know, their babies are in there and everybody's just have, you know, like probably not even watching the movie so much. Right. Uh, and right. then what, what happened is Butch says what what changed everything was when they came out with sound mu- movies between 1926 and 1931. And then you mm-hmm. actually had to listen to what was going on. And, and that's mm-hmm. when people started saying, you know, like, hey, shut up, you know, or quiet down. Because, yeah, I right. want to hear it. Right. Yeah. And and he says that uh, at that point, silence was self-enforced with audiences shushing talkers. And in silence, the audience seems to have become less assertive and more concentrated on the movie. So... <laughs> well, it depends what neighborhood yeah. you're in and it depends what's playing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yes, overall, yes. And, and then, you know, we, we how do we know what's acceptable when, when we go out in public? And Kirsty Sedgman has written a book called On Being Unreasonable, Why Being Bad Can Be a Force for Good. And... And she, again, she asked the question, like, how can we know the right way to act within a whole range of social circumstances? And she says also, which is kind of what you said, is like, how do we ever hope to reach agreements in a world where everyone has slightly different ideas about what those things mean? Yeah. I mean, the fact that we get along as well as we do is kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah. Really? I mean, yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. she's, I mean, there's so much that can go wrong at I know, any moment. I, like our show, you, I could say something you could turn <laughs> on me. You could mute me. You could mute me if you want to just go off. <laughs> uh-huh. Hell yeah. Uh, I could, I've got the control. <laughs> <laughs> but, she, but she, she notes though that, you know, the willingness to live among throngs of strangers, which is kind of what you're talking about. Hmm. Sets us apart from mm. every other species on the planet. And being yeah. together, Sedgman says, a stranger among strangers is to exist in a constant state of faith. And that's what you were yes. talking about with the that's line. With the line about. between. Yes. The yellow lines. We're, we all have faith <laughs> that no one will cross that line. But it's just a piece right. of tape. It's just, a, and you can't get by <sighs> if you're so afraid, like if you're too afraid that everybody yes. will cross that line, then you can't exist out there. You can't go out. Right. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. suffer from and that. And Sedgman says, we need these lines or boundaries. Uh, in fact, this vast global network that we call society only exists because of our ability to draw these lines. And we rely mm. upon them to function. And, mm. But she says, we have to be careful about what we label as appropriate or inappropriate. Because historically, uh, people have used that line or what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable behavior to kind of oppress other people or to kind of keep certain people in line. Absolutely. You know. Well, like you said, the lower class, they changed the rules at the movie theater, at the uh, theater so that the lower class, which became a real problem with culture. I mean, that's where improv comes from. It was started as a way to kind of access people who weren't seeing right, theater. right lower class classes factory where people who do blue collar who just didn't didn't have access to theater and it, that's how improv oh, started cool. yeah. really was to kind of you know get to them those yeah. peeps but um yeah I, you know i would say and we've talked about this before that when you're doing comedy you definitely want alcohol <laughs> to be served you want damn straight <laughs> 
damn straight. This gig I got at the Association for Recovery and Higher Education, they're going to be stone cold <laughs> it's sober. Different. It's a different show. But comedy is... Sure comedy as hell is. is. I think comedy needs some booze to be flowing a little bit, you know. Hell <laughs> yes. More the, more the better. Uh, but Sedgman <laughs> says that, you know, uh, appropriate behavior... We have we make minuscule adaptations to our behavior in order to minimize interpersonal friction, often without even realizing it. Hmm. So when you're hmm. out in a crowd with people, uh, there's certain rules, certain behavior when you're in a big crowd of people, whether you you feel it or I mean, you you know, you've never been given a, a, a explicit lesson about how to behave in the crowd, but there's certain rules that we all follow. Yes. You pick up on right. cues and some people are, are not good at picking up right. on cues. Right. It, and know. she notes in, in your yeah. example of your wife going around the other side of the, the line, <laughs> she goes that lining or queuing up is when we, an example of when we really feel the normative expectations of society uh, intensely. Like there's certain rules, like you're oh, not supposed yeah. to be right on top of the person in front of you. Oh, <laughs> I hate it. I was at the airport and in Chicago and we had to go through the, uh, TSA, yeah. the yeah. security line. And in Chicago, they put them all through one. It's, it's, a it's right. not great uh, at O'Hare. I love O'Hare, but the, that is not great. And, um, the, it, there was a guy who was gonna, he was late to his yeah. flight. And he was so nervous, he was right up on my yeah, back yeah. in line. We're in line, the security yeah. line, you know? And I'm like, here, go yeah. ahead. And he got three <laughs> steps ahead of me. You know, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. did that help you? Yeah, it, but that's the, and, those are the I, rules. I, I had overheard he was, yes, yes. And he was going to miss his flight anyway. I already knew yeah. when it, he was like, there's no chance, but, dude. But Sedgman, You can't show up 30 <laughs> minutes before a flight anymore. That's over. That is over. Sedgman notes also like, uh, you know, how, like when you're at the grocery store, for example, and mm. you know, when someone leaves their cart and they run, they're like, oh, I forgot something. And they leave and you're behind them. Yes. Like, what is, what are you supposed oh. to do at that point? You know? Oh. That's rough. Or or ten items or less, and they've got yeah, fifteen. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. and and then like like if you ever if you're in a line and you want to step out to look at something else, like you see a magazine over there that you want to take it. Like how yeah. long? She she gives a good example of in a line at a grocery store. Like how far away is acceptable before you break that contract you have with the other people in the line? Yes, you know. Yes. Um. Love it, that. And it's it, it's another it's something that always gives me anxiety is like when you go to a restaurant and of course you try to give your name when you go there just as you're waiting to go in. But then you see other people who right. come in and then get let in before you. And you're like, oh, I know those people came in yes. after me. Why are they getting to go ahead? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's Yes, like you at that nude cowboy show <laughs> right, you went to. Right. I got it. I got it. What the hell is that guy got? But Mary and I, when we were at we were at the Eiffel Tower years ago, and it, it was a huge line as always, and and then there were like three. They must have been Eastern European, I think, but the, one of them was pregnant, and they came through, and mm. we're just cutting past everybody, and we were saying, you know, she's pregnant, she's pregnant. We we can't, you know, we can't wait. We need to get ahead. And you could tell everybody. Wait a minute, <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, <laughs> you could tell everybody didn't want to let them go ahead, but we were all too. Well, they shouldn't. We have. were all too polite to too say polite. anything. Yeah, because you were all out of towners. If there were French in that line, they would have given right. them a what? Well, what for. happened is they ran up against other <laughs> Eastern Europeans that were like, "Ah, <laughs> wait yeah. your turn, yeah. like yeah. around to it. Yeah. Turn around. Yeah. yeah, me too. I'm pregnant too." <laughs> Uh, and so then we get to why do we feel that the rules are breaking down right now? And Sedgman investigates this point by quoting David Harvey, who's the author of a book called A Brief History of Neoliberalism. And Harvey Ooh. says that in the 1960s, there was a movement to counter communism and trade unionism by emphasize, emphasizing individual responsibility over social responsibility. 
Mm-hmm. And and this was what, you know, it culminated in 1987 when uh, Margaret Thatcher gave a gave an interview. And I think it was like New Woman interview or something or New New Woman magazine. But she said that there was, quote, no such thing as society, only individuals and their immediate families. And, mm. and Sedgman says ever since then, this neoliberal project has continued determinedly to shift the Western discourse away from social responsibility and towards personal responsibility with far reaching consequences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, a- again, it kind of, you know, and that was the time with, remember, in uh, uh, Wall Street, Gordon Gecko. You know, like yes. greed is good. It's all about me. It's all about me. Yeah, and yeah. and so you you have keep telling people that for like forty years, and suddenly it's not just about wealth. It's about like your behaviors when you go out in public. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Sedgman too talks about the rise. Another uh, cause she says maybe the the rise of the connection economy, or what she calls the disconnection economy. And that's where social media tries to break us up into little groups, different groups, and then create mm-hmm. conflict mm-hmm. between our groups. They, they com- mm-hmm. commodify that conflict. And, and so, you know, what began a couple of decades ago, Sedgman says, the disconnection economy by which we have gradually, relentlessly incentivized into individualistic modes of thinking rather than communitarian modes of thinking. So she says at that point, when you go out and you go into an audience, that's where you see people just all trying to just get, you know, uh, content for their own social media feeds when they go out in public rather than enjoying right. the, right. the actual um, the show itself. We're all the star of the movie. <laughs> Nobody's the extra. We'll get to that because that's actually something that everybody they call it the uh, main character syndrome. And the main mm. character syndrome is is actually it's not it hasn't become an actual uh, DSM or like psychological diagnosis yet, but people have noticed that it's it's a collection of behaviors that people have. And in the article beyond the role of main character syndrome, Saya de Marais says that the main character syndrome is a new colloquial term that's used to describe someone who sees themselves as the main character or the protagonist in the performance of life. But isn't that all of us anyway? I mean, aren't we all kind of doing that? Well, there's some good thing. I mean, I read where some psychologists think that there's, there's good that can come out of that. If you you get, uh, if it encourages you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Oh, I see. What we're talking Mm -hmm. about here is someone who sees everything that happens to them. De Marais says, uh, only through the lens of how it affects them. Okay, so they're mm-hmm. the main character mm-hmm. in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so interesting that all of you have your right. lives, but the camera's right. on me. Right. And people who, she says, people who think they're the main character tend to believe that they're the most important person in most situations and interactions with people. Okay. <laughs> right. And that is, that's false, except when it comes to right. me. Right. And that's why when they're, when they're being obnoxious or when they're being rude at a movie theater, it really doesn't matter because you're not part of the movie. You're an extra that's supposed to be there uh, supporting them. You know right. what I mean? Right. Or right. When, right. You, right. Right. when you lose it on a plane or you demand to have a certain seat on the aisle on a plane when someone's already there to switch your seat, those other people aren't really people. They're just extras in your movie. Right. You know what I mean? We, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and the thing is, the problem I have with that uh, is, first of all, life isn't a movie. <laughs> so, and, and movies have movies are edited movies are have writers tv shows have writers that make (laughs) people seem clever that make people seem you know right important that could say the the best thing and the the worst thing is to see somebody when i was in uh working in hollywood when you'd see somebody that was on a tv show where their character was very funny and then you'd meet them in real life and you'd be like they're really not that funny (laughs) yeah (laughs) You know, 
Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, and so disappointing. Yeah. yeah. Or and then sometimes yeah. they actually think that they were that character. You know, where they try to like pull uh-huh. it off, like they're as funny as the character, or as charming as the character. Yeah. And, and it, uh-huh. w- it, w- it wouldn't be yeah. like, no, this is real life. Your character gets to say that because you have a room full of comics writing for you to do that. You know? <laughs> uh, and then, you know, Dama Ray says uh, she quotes Natalie Rosado, who's a mental health counselor, who says that uh, the main character syndrome is synonymous with being so focused on your own story that you forget that billions of other stories are happening at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, and, which is the magic of yeah. it all. Remember in Shaun of the Dead in that movie when, like, that the zombie hunters mm-hmm. that were following run up against another group of zombie hunters who look exactly like them. <laughs> yes, <you know>? yes, <laughs> so, their own Saint Elmo's right, right. fire. Everybody, <laughs> we're not that interesting. Yeah. We're exactly there's some other group exactly like us out there. So you got it exactly like yeah. us, and uh. You know, and the thing is, we, you know, even sitcoms only have like A and B stories. So, <laughs> so if you imagine right. everybody in that theater has their own storyline that's going on, there's going to be problems there. <laughs> and no. uh, I remember Mary told me one time, Mary, when she lived in L.A., she worked one time for a philanthropic organization that was run by a very wealthy man. I won't say which one it was. Uh, but it was, it was a, <laughs> it was me. Give it, let's just, it was me. I don't mind. It's okay. But she had their fundraise. The person in charge of their fundraising once told them that the organization, that there are only a hundred people in the world that matter and that the rest of us are just extras wow. in those people's movie. Wow. And, and wow. that's always stuck with me as when you're on your phone or when you're, you know, living out your movie at a movie theater, you know mm. what? You may, you're just another extra, unless you're one of those hundred people, one of those hundred billionaires, you're just an extra down here with the rest of us. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's right. And we're all, we're all going, we're all going to be buried. We're all going yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, Kiersey Sedg- Sedgman says that live performance is the canary in the coal mine, and big societal frustrations and social changes tend to erupt in the performance venues first. Uh, mm. So I don't know. I don't know what the solution is to bad behavior in in public places. Um, you know in In the article, we no longer know how to behave. Sarah Stewart says that maybe people need to learn how to experience boredom when they're out in public. (laughs) You know, Mm, Um, mm. and and to try to be less. Yeah, and maybe we just need to push it so far. I mean, so much of of today seems to me to be kind of about the pendulum swinging out to to remind ourselves why it's not so bad to have compromise and yeah. Uh, you know, that, that, that we have to, but we have to test that to remind ourselves why we built these things in the first yeah. place. Yeah. That's a great idea that we've forgotten. We've forgotten why, why they were there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's like in the live addiction show, you know, we say that the treatment for self-obsession is other obsession. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, you know, to me, to be courteous and self-aware and respectful of other people when you go out to a show uh, isn't going to let us slide into communism. <laughs> you know, being part of a community, no. I think. Unless unless they're not going to have your flat tire ready at two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then... Yeah, <laughs> all bets are right, off. Right. <laughs> uh, I yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And we all make mistakes like that too. Yeah. You know, like if I if I accidentally cut somebody off in front of in traffic, it's like, oh shoot, that was a mistake. I don't do that. Yeah. 
if they do it to me, they always do that in my mind, and they're assholes right. and should be destroyed. Right, right. <laughs> there's there's got to be a middle ground there, you know what I mean? It's got to be yeah, a middle ground. we got to cut each other some slack. Uh, well, I'm going to cut you slack. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I've decided. I'm going to cut Thank you some slack. You've got a lot going on in Kansas City, and I'm going to ease up. I, I'm going to allow us to, you know, deliver our episodes maybe a day late. Yeah. You Thank know. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's okay. We're going to be all right. I, I have one last uh, article I read. It was The Guardian had asked people to write in with stories, bad stories about audience behavior in movie theaters that recently. And one person told him that th there were a couple people in front of him who were looking at their phones and talking through the entire movie. And when he, <laughs> when he tried to police it and ask them if they could please put their phones away and, and stop talking, they said to him, if you wanted to watch a movie in silence, you should have stayed at home. So, 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 <laughs> so that shows you how it's changed. It's flipped around. Like 20 years yeah. ago, it would have been like, if you wanted you know, talk, you should have stayed at home. Now it's all switched around. But yeah. now maybe we're just going back to the way it That's used to great. always be in the early days of movies. Yep. You know what I mean? Until the Bowery <laughs> Boys come in and ruin it all yeah. again. All right, John. So, uh, no, yeah, I, I, I was thinking that uh, I have no solutions. Just, I don't know. Just know we're all extras. I guess that's all. <laughs> yes. Kind of work yes. Back. Let's all be on the chorus line right. in the back. Working actors. Well, uh, this is this is human number two signing off. And this is human number one. Thanks for listening to everyone. If you found this podcast interesting, please tell a friend about it. And don't forget to check out our sponsor, Watson and Company Socks at uh, Watson-co.square.site. Yes. The world may not have your back, but Watson and Company has your feet. And uh, yes. anyway, they're on the old IG Instagram <laughs> right, as well. Right. All right, guys. We love you. John, love All you. Right. I'll talk to you after the reunion. Love See you guys you. soon. Thanks. Sounds good. Behave on the plane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>